Yes, our gyrian nervosa. If you're an enthusiast of obscure hallucinogens, this is one to reckon with. Possibly, gram for gram, it is the most powerful plant hallucinogen on the planet. And yet, though there are 13 species of our gyria, all containing psychoactive compounds, spread from Kerala in India down through Micronesia, there's no history of human usage in that entire cultural area. So there are mysteries about who knows these things. You know, when you go to the Amazon, most people have a kind of noble, savage prejudice, and they think that it has to be the naked people who are off-river, who are very wild and woolly, and then they make the good ayahuasca. Often this is not the case. Often it's the guy who lives on the edge of Iquitos or Pucallpa who tends his garden and uh, is fairly conversant with the modern world. Some of you may know Manuel Cord um, F. Bruce Lamb's book um, Rio Tigre and Beyond. He describes a situation in there where a uh, uh, a man who had in his youth been kidnapped by Indians and learned to make very good ayahuasca. Later, he encounters another tribe of Indians. He's on a rosewood collecting expedition to a remote part of the jungle. And he encounters these Indians and they invite him to take ayahuasca with them. And it's just garbage as far as this guy can go. So he says, I'll show you how they do it where I come from, and makes it for these people, and literally becomes a culture hero overnight, <laughs> is hailed as the, the great reformer of their ritual, and just simply because he showed them how to get really, really smashed uh, on it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the DMT is in the desmanthus, and the and the pergamon contains the MAO inhibiting harmaline. It's in the seed of the, the desmanthus. No, it's in the root bark scrapings, and the harmala, the harmine, the harmaline in pergamon harmala is spread throughout the plant and concentrated in the little black seeds. If you don't want to drive out to Elko find an Iranian market here in L.A. and tell them that you want to buy Hermal, H-U-R-M-A-L, and they will sell you the seeds of Pagaman Harmala. It's used uh, in Iranian households as a fumigant, an incense. You just throw some on a charcoal, yeah. on a bed of coals, and it makes this wonderful... Um, incense-like smoke, which is actually intoxicating. Uh, I mean, a, a wonderful thing to do if you want to do some exploratory chemistry is take, uh, take half a dose, take half a dose of mushrooms, and then after a couple of hours, smoke some pergamon harmala in a, in a bong or a pipe. And the MAO inhibiting characteristic of the harmaline will immediately lift the curtain for about 15 minutes on a very spectacular series of very cool hallucinations. In other words, they're hallucinations where you can just sit and look thinking, my goodness, this is fascinating and compelling, <laughs> rather than the other kind of hallucination where you're, <gasps> <laughs> you know. So we call this uh, mushroom plus pagaman harmala combination vegetable television <laughs> because it, it's approximately that engaging, but very, very uh, non-threatening and, and reassuring for beginners. That's a mix of mushrooms. After an hour and a half, smoke uh, a quarter of a teaspoon of pergamon harmala seeds. Can, can the seeds be eaten? Oh, yeah, they're very small and hard and black, and you'll want to get a, a brawn coffee grinder. A brawn coffee grinder is a great tool for the would be psychoactivist. <laughs> it will. Uh, 
It will grind, it will flour nutmeg, reduce nutmeg to flour. That's, nutmeg's fascinating. I used to take it when I was in high school. I used to take it uh, at night and I would stay up late and study. It would sort of wire me and then I would sleep. But when I would wake up in the morning, I would be absolutely smashed. And I didn't even know what it really was. It was, all, it was almost before I smoked cannabis. So I was dealing with this, these walks to school in the morning where all the colors were bright, a song on my lips, a skip in my step. I could hardly... Um, and uh, you can also reduce uh, morning glory seeds to flour in one of those brawn grinders. So that's a very good kit, yeah. No, I uh, I ground it in a mortar and pestle fairly crudely at that phase. But what you do is you just cap it up, flour it, and cap it up. You know, it contains meristocin, which is psychoactive and which is a precursor for MDMA, and is a, quite a nice thing. I mean, it's not going to shake the foundations of the planet, but it's very good. What? A couple. Not a lot. Oh, that's what I should say. <laughs> Do not, uh, you know, people sometimes with plants, they get the attitude that you need to do a lot because it's spread thin. In most cases, that's true. But in the case of nutmeg, it isn't true. It's a cap, a double O capsule. It just doesn't count for the spice that you can buy from the chili spice rack. No, it does. Same, same. Yeah, well, the reason I preferred grinding the whole nutmeg was because it's obviously fresher if it's ground. And you can buy whole nutmeg at Safeway. Prisoners know this. If you'd done more hard time, you <laughs> wouldn't be asking these questions. <laughs> well, let me say a little bit more about this. Uh, the Zoroastrian religion is generally considered to precede the Vedic religion of Soma. Soma is this mysterious Vedic intoxicant of great antiquity. The ninth mandala of the Rig Veda is this enormous hymn of praise to Soma, greater than Indra, it says. Uh, Unbroken throughout the history of the Zoroastrian religion is the sacrament of Hauma, H-A-O-M-A. Hauma and Soma appear to be historically related, and Hauma is Pagaman Harmala. If you're interested in reading about all this, there's a book uh, called Hauma and Harmaline by uh, David Flattery. It's uh, Near East Publication number 23, and it's available from the Near East Studies Department of UC Berkeley. Fascinating book. I mean, you learn, for instance, that in the classic phase of the Zoroastrian religion, the only method for gaining knowledge about the invisible world was the use of drugs. Any other method was scorned as completely preposterous. And since this is rather close to my own position, uh, I'm pleased to find it in place. Uh, they talk in that book, they discuss how there is this concept in Zoroastrianism of what is called the Menang, the Menang world. And the Menang world is only accessible through Haoma. It's only accessible through pharmacological means. That's the dogma. Yeah. Can you explain a little more about morning glory seeds? Morning glory seeds, yes. Now, this is something that's accessible and that those of you who find yourselves bemoaning the lack of, of availability could overcome. The, the heavenly blue morning glory with the heart-shaped leaf that's important because I see around here, I see blue morning glories with a leaf that looks like a grape leaf. That's not it, folks. That won't do it. It has to have a, a valentine-shaped leaf and this brilliant blue or white or white and blue flower. Those are hybrids. The blue is the wild type. It's called heavenly blue. The white 
is called pearly gates, and the white and blue is called flying saucer. These guys must have been doing more than uh, <clears throat> something. Was that? Now, listen carefully, and I'll avoid a lawsuit, and you'll avoid a tummy ache. The morning glory seeds, which are sold in garden stores here, are the morning glory that you want, the blue, heavenly blue morning glory. But seed companies have dipped these seeds in a poison specifically to keep you from getting high off these morning glory seeds. So what you have to do then is uh, overcome this by stealth always our best weapon. <laughs> Stealth means buy the morning glories and grow them and produce an uncontaminated crop of your own. Now, the morning glory seeds that you will produce by this means you have to take around 250 for a person of ordinary body weight. So if you are low or high, make the adjustment accordingly. Uh, the morning glory seeds can be floured in your brawn grinder and then mixed into applesauce or a milkshake or some thick medium because actually it's pretty disgusting. Mm -hmm. Now there's a slight problem here, which is the seed also contains ester coumarone, which is an emetic and makes your, your stomach cramp. So you c that will leave after about an hour. So you can either pay your dues and sit there with a terrible tummy ache for this very critical hour, or there are strategies for getting that ester coumarone out of there with solvent washes. I don't want to give the details because too many people blow themselves to kingdom come. High molecular weight solvents like chloroform and petroleum ether tend to be slightly tricky for the non-chemist to work with. Uh, so, but if you are a chemist, go, go to the literature and, and you'll figure it out. A solvent which, which sometimes works, which is non-explosive relatively, is a grain alcohol. But grain alcohol, the reason chemists don't use it is because it's not, it's not very efficient. It, you'll get like 60 to 70 percent of a sample, where if you go to chloroform or pet ether, you can push that up to 96, 97 percent. Uh, if you get the seed, again, treat it like the morning glory. Flower it in a, in a very fine grinder. Those seeds are hard as hell, so you've got to do that. Flower it. Soak it in water, shake the water vigorously several times. A fairly lar the larger the volume of water, the more efficient the filtration or the extraction will be. And then pour all the water through a melitta filter, and then collect the 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 uh, uh, you know the water, and uh, and to take it. I don't think it would be a good idea to try to concentrate that by, by heat or you'll destroy the active principle. These beta carbolines, harmine, harmaline, they all have a, there is a slight stomach thing. Uh, they come on in about an hour. There's what's called visual streaming. I am assuming, first of all, I'm making a number of assumptions here that you are sitting in silent darkness and that you are, have an empty stomach. And then you get visual streaming, which if you've never seen this, it's basically, it looks like you're driving through a bunch of after images. You're dri there are these purple and chartreuse lights sliding past. And when you stare forward, you can see them sliding past. After about 10 minutes of that, and possibly a hit of cannabis, it becomes more explicit and you move into the realm of, of what's called hypnagogia. Hypnagogia are dancing mice, little colored candies, pieces of ribbons, gears, screws, the, the, the trivia, the, the uh, impedimentia of the phantasmagoria of your mind, you know. And then after about 10 minutes of that, 
And of course, what's happening, if you have a pharmacological vision of this, is thousands of these molecules are arriving at the synaptic site of activity, elbowing aside the local population of uh, endogenous neurotransmitters, <laughs> getting them out of the way plugging themselves into the receptor site and beginning to lift the electron spin resonance level and push them in new directions. And you can almost hear it doing this. Uh, and uh, then beyond the, the hypnagogia, there is the, the actual trip. And it usually is encountered, you have to go through what Merciliad called the rupture of the mundane plane. This means that the world has to, fall, it, it like falls apart or explodes or settles down on you. There's a sense of a, of a rupture of plane and then the, the co, uh, visually coherent, emotionally laden, information laden, high content hallucinations occur and many people have taken psychedelic drugs and never gotten past the hypnagogia. They don't know that there's something out there besides dancing mice and spinning geometric wheels and stuff like that. But beyond that, you, you cross over. And that's the, tri the typical model of a trip. Now, what happens with all of these things to greater and lesser degrees, LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, ayahuasca is, and I've never actually ever heard an explanation for this. For some reason, the experience comes in waves. There's the first wave, that makes sense, that's the drug taking hold, but why then, after 20 minutes of uh, unbelievably outlandish hallucination, will it like all stop? You know, and it's like a moment ago you were screaming for mercy. Now you look around and you say, I'm down. Am I down? I, I seem to be down. You know, and sometimes you seem to come all the way down. Like on LSD, it's like it totally turns off sometimes. And then about five minutes later, it comes again. And you get another wave. And if you've taken a really dedicated hit of <laughs> ayahuasca, for example, you will get like as many as five or six of these waves throughout the evening. And the first one is usually the strongest. If you take a, a, a um, effective but not strong dose of ayahuasca, you will get one pass. And often, and then if you take slightly less, you'll get one pass and it will be weak. So if you take ayahuasca, at all times pay attention because you may be looking at something thinking, well, this is not so interesting. I'm sure it's going to be much better in an hour. And you may actually be looking at as good as it's going to get that evening. Um, and psilocybin also comes in waves like this. LSD very dramatically. DMT not because DMT is one enormous brief wave. I mean, DMT sort of brings all the issues together. And, and I, the way I think of these psychedelics experientially is as a series of concentric circles. Maybe like the outer circle is mescaline, and the next circle in is LSD, and the next circle in is psilocybin. And the next circle in is DMT. It's almost as though the psychedelic experience is whatever drug or whatever substance you take, it leads you deeper and deeper in the, in the same direction. And of course, with DMT, you not only hear the aliens, you see the aliens, you not only see the aliens, you become an alien. It, it seems to be the most radical of all of these things in terms of the experience, it's also the most natural of all of these things. It also is the safest. It stands the ordinary standards of courage and risk on their head because 
here it is. It's the most terrifying, the most spectacular, and the safest. None of us, including myself, have fully come to grips with this paradox. Uh, we would rather do less safe, less scary drugs, I think. Uh, DMT is, uh, is pretty impressive in most situations. So, yeah. Are you against meditation when you think it doesn't work as well as hallucination? Well, no, I just, I think they're completely different realms of human activity. I can't, uh, m I mean, meditation, you don't hallucinate. You don't, they say you do, but they aren't very convincing. And plus, the monks then rush over and explain that you're doing it wrong. So, you know, what's the deal? Um, I think, I, I if... If by meditation you mean lying down and closing your eyes or sitting up and closing your eyes a lot, I do that a lot and I like it, but I, I would never confuse it with the psychedelic enterprise. You're not going to get you the same regulatory condition. Pardon me? You're not going to get you the same regulatory condition. I, it's only my opinion, but I really don't. Mm -hmm. I think that it's that that all of these spiritual techniques are not um, substitutions for the psychedelic experience, but trade-offs. You know, I mean, organized religion is as concerned with controlling social groups as organized politics is. And the, the, uh, the visionary or ecstatic experience is unsettling to the religious mentality. You know, even among fundamentalist Christians, uh, if you're not one, they all seem more or less alike. But if you move into that world, you discover that they are very strongly polarized in two directions. Those who are scripturalists and those who are experientialists the glossolalias, the speaking in tongues, the holy rollers, that sort of thing. And the scripturalists are very uncomfortable around the experientialists because to them it looks like demonic possession and they get really agitated about that. Um, I think that medicine and meditation go pretty well together. I'll take ayahuasca or psilocybin and sit in the lotus position for many hours. And it, it's, it's incredible how they, how they work well together. And then after the experience is over, the next time I meditate, I feel like I'm still doing the medicine. Yeah, well, I think that all of these techniques, like mantra, yantra, tantra, whatever, they work incredibly well in the presence of psychedelics leading me to suppose that what these are are tools that were developed in the Paleolithic world of psychedelic magic, and all we have now are, are these tools, but we don't have the original engine that drove them. Yes, I, I am very bored by spiritual practice unless I've taken a psychedelic, and then, you know, mantric chanting is beyond the power of mind to encompass or describe. Sex isn't bad either. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it seems to be a general functional enhancer is what it is. Yeah. What about drums? Acoustical driving is also a tried and true tradition. But see, it's not about the exclusivity of method but the combination of method. I mean, what you want to do is beat your drum while sitting in yab yum, while stoned on X, while at the holy mountain, while the astrological configuration is correct, and then, you know, you, you know, line it all up and then push it through. That's the way to do it, I think. Yeah. Can you talk about more well, it, again, it goes back to this function of boundary dissolution. Creativity, if you analyze what do, what do we mean when we say that, it, it basically means being able to transcend the ordinary. 
you see it in a way nobody else ever saw it, whatever it is, and so that's creativity. Uh, psychedelics, by dissolving the boundaries of cultural expectation, uh, let you see things in new ways. I was in a situation recently where it was evening, and uh, silhouetted against the sky were flame cypress trees, but they were all black. And I was looking at them. I've seen flame cypress trees against twilight skies many times. You all have as well. And suddenly it was like there was this shift. And I didn't see it as a flame cypress tree anymore. I saw it as black dust pouring out of a certain point of the sky and cascading like a waterfall. And I was looking at three waterfalls of microfine black powder pouring out of points about 60 feet above the ground. Well, I, was, I didn't even mention it to the person I was with, but I, I just noticed this psychedelic uh, perception. Uh, the other night, this was really interesting to me, the other night, just as I was falling asleep, a phrase came into my mind that I, I liked, but I didn't understand it. In fact, I didn't think it meant anything. I just thought it was an interesting phrase. And, and I thought about it for about a minute, and then it did the same thing that the flame cypress tree did. It went ploink, and this other dimension sprouted out of it. And I understood it, and I thought, this is a very interesting idea. And I've never thought it before. The thought was, uh, if time were space, then history is a cobweb. That was all it was. But I don't take these leaps very often. So I was delighted uh, because I knew a moment would come when I could lay it on a group of people like I've just done. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's a catalyst for cognitive activity. That's what the mushroom is. Dance, drama, song, painting, body expression, creativity, and simply the passive act of understanding. It, this is what it does for us, and this is what we love to do. I mean, we are creatures of the mind. You know, they talk about virtual reality as some future technology that's going to change everything. We've been living in a virtual reality for the past 6,000 years. I mean, look at cities like New York and London and Los Angeles. I mean, the, every nature has disappeared. Everything you see is a human idea downloaded into material existence. It's entirely virtual. It doesn't disappear at the punch of a dial, but it is as virtual as the virtual realities that will eventually be made out of, uh, out of light behind goggles. Culture, uh, the whole thing is that culture and language tend to become traps, and yet they can be the platforms for enormous freedom if you understand what it's all about. And what it's all about is you. You are the center of the mandala. You are not marginalized in any way. And the message that the culture gives us is that we are marginal. It doesn't matter whether you, if you've got a hundred million dollars, Fortune magazine will inform you that so do 10,000 other people on the North American continent. There's nothing special about you. It's, and so we are constantly, this is part of the democratic legacy. We are constantly told you're not special. Special isn't special. Anybody could do it. What the psychedelic, and so then when you look for guidance, direction, mentorship, we always look toward institutions. Well, I'll go to the university, or I'll go to the army, or I'll do something. Somebody will tell me, will give me a larger purpose. But it's really yourself that is uh, the final arbiter. 
And if you keep yourself as the final arbiter, you will be less susceptible to infection by cultural illusion. Now, the problem with this is that it makes you feel bad to not be infected by cultural illusion because it's called alienation. You know, but this is like, I can't solve all problems. The reason we feel alienated is because the society is infantile, trivial, and stupid. So uh, the cost of sanity in this society is a certain level of alienation. I grapple with this because I'm a parent. And I think anybody who has children, you come to this realization, you know, what'll it be? alienated, cynical intellectual, or slack-jawed, half-wit consumer of the horseshit being handed down from on high. There is not much choice in there, you see, and, and we all want our children to be well-adjusted. It's Unfortunately, there's nothing to be well-adjusted to, so uh, that's a real problem. It's almost like we've been inoculated here for this culture. <laughs> yeah. Terence said, um, Eric Brown said that to be adjusted to a neurotic society is to be neurotic yourself. Yeah, I think, well, and I really believe that extra environmentalism, which is a nicer, though longer, word for alienation, is defensible and shouldn't be thought of as pathological. What I noticed in going to the Amazon in Indonesia and these places is that the person you want to get to is the shaman. And, but the shaman is different from everybody else. Like when you go into an Amazonian tribe that's way upriver or something, the people behave the way you would expect naive, untraveled people to behave. They want to touch your Gore-Tex and, you know, look at your camera and, and look through the binoculars and fiddle with the can opener and all this. No shaman would ever stoop to such uh, behavior. A shaman is not knows that cultures are provisional and is interested in you as a person. The other people don't even see you as a person because you're huge, white, strange, smelling, and incomprehensible. The shaman sees you as a person, and it's because he is alienated. The reason shamans can do their magic is because they are outside the belief system. I really think that that's true. Everyone else believes, you know, that the guy in the other village can send the mojo and mess with you. The shaman knows that that's not quite right. how it works. And so then he, as it were, can go behind the board and fix the cultural TV that everybody else is just watching. So I think alienation, extra environmentalism, shamanism, whatever you want to call it, is simply individualism in the context of cultures that don't value individualism. And cultures don't. You know, it's said nature acts to preserve the species. Cultures act to preserve the illusions of the population. They're not interested in you if you're an Einstein or a Jackson Pollock or unless they can fit you in to the pre-established systems of commerce and canons of aesthetic order and so forth and so on. And then that's called being civilized. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Um, can you mention something about this uh, craze about the frogs? I don't think I did, but if you say I did, I did. Oh, could I? Well, yes, let me explain. Uh, the question is, what's with licking frogs? <clears throat> I'm not sure I got it right, but, well, you know, you kiss a lot of frogs before you find a prince, and uh, you probably lick a lot more. <laughs> uh, Fro uh, toads, not frogs, let's give the devil his due here. Toads of certain species produce a relative of DMT in large glands in their necks. Why this is, is not clear. Uh, 
considering that this uh, exudate or this um, material will kill a dog if a dog picks up a toad like that in his mouth within minutes. It's pretty spectacular. It's reasonable to suppose that then this is just a defense that has been evolved. Some of you may have seen the dinosaur in Jurassic Park that spits poison in your face. We're talking something like that. Uh, the toad creates this, DM, or this 5 methoxy DMT in this gland, and when the glands are squeezed, uh, it comes out on the surface of the toad's skin. It's a near relative of DMT. My, speaking from my personal battery of many prejudices, I would say I don't care for it. It complicates my job enormously because people do this stuff and they think A, that it is DMT, or B, if they're slightly better informed, that it's just like DMT. It is in fact chemically called 5-methoxy-DMT. However, it is nothing like DMT. It's as much like DMT as radio is like uh, television. And that's where the difference lies. The 5-MeO does not trigger the most spectacular effect associated with DMT, which is these three-dimensional crawling hallucinations that come out of the woodwork and reveal the true nature of reality to you. When you take 5-MeO, DMT, you have all of the physical presentation of DMT. There's a sense of uh, a, a kind of light anesthesia through the limbs. There's a sense of falling forward into a void. There's a sense of losing body boundary. Now, at that point in DMT, those symptoms would give way to the trip. At that point in 5-MeO-DMT, those symptoms give way to the beginning of the come down. And if you, if people who have never taken DMT sometimes rave about 5-MeO and say, you know, this was the most astonishing thing I've ever happened to me. People who are familiar with DMT can yawn their way all the way through it because you're braced for the DMT thing. I mean, you think, oh my God, it feels just like it. Here it comes, it's gonna be upon me. Five, four, three, two, one, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five. It's not coming in. It doesn't come in. And so, uh, and then 5-MeO uh, is fatal in sheep as well as dogs, spectacularly fatal in sheep. And so I guess if you're a sheep, it's counterindicated. Uh, doesn't seem to be harmful in human beings, with, but with so little data available, I think maybe we should, uh, you know, there are old psychedelicists and bold psychedelicists, but there are no old, bold psychedelicists. And there might be a few. Of course, getting them to speak ordinary English is a real choice. Don't point at me. I'm a child, a mere stripling. <clears throat> okay. Well, anybody else? You can, we can do this till doomsday. I may never get to my agenda. Not to discourage you. <laughs> Well, yeah. Have I had any contact with the government? Have I had any contact with the government? Uh, not exact. Well, up until a week ago, the answer to this question was yes. I mean, no. <laughs> when I got home from Esalen the last time, there was a really funny letter, which I haven't quite figured out how to respond to. Dear Mr. McKenna, uh, I'm an officer of the California State Police, fascinated with DMT, and recently read the interview with you in the San Francisco Chronicle. I wonder if you would be willing to meet with me and have coffee so we can discuss this at your earliest possible convenience. So, 
I, what I did was fairly chicken shit, actually. I, I found a copy of Food of the Gods, and I sent it off, and I said, this is my latest book, or this is a book of mine. It deals in part with DMT. Uh, give it a quick read, and if you're still interested in a get-together, call me. So once you establish that you're an intellectual, they just harmless, a nut of some sort. Yeah, now I'm a rapper. Now I'm making Leary's mistake, the 25-year-old, the, the 15 to 25-year-old crowd. But I've got news for you. Next year, Invisible Landscape is coming out. It was the book my brother and I originally wrote. And when that book comes out, all my books will be in the public domain or, you know, available. Sound Photosynthesis has at least 70 of my tapes. Dolphin Tapes has 40 more. Then there's a scattering of other people with a few. Uh, I am not going to do this till hell freezes over. I have uh, a whole other plan for myself. And uh, I think also, you know, once you crusade for 10 years, if you haven't captured Jerusalem, you better go back to farming in Provence. <laughs> and, and that's more or less metaphorically what I intend to do. Pardon me? No, it's, I'll tell you some of my plans uh, briefly because it doesn't relate to this. Um, 220 species of trilobite occur in the shales of southern Bohemia. I plan to go to Prague and organize the peasants of Bohemia to collect these various species of trilobites, ship them into a central warehouse in Prague while we will identify, photograph them, and issue a very high-end catalog for collectors of rare fossils. Mm. And... Uh, I will become the trilobite maven of Prague 6 and uh, disappear from this domain. Because I think I've said all I have to say. I mean, not today, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but in the course of doing all this, uh, yeah. I've heard you mention that you see Prague as becoming a real <laughs> central uh, point for thinkers and poets and radical uh, ideas to kind of coalesce and to be the fulcrum to kind of bring this country into a new flowering, if that's a good way to Well, I think that the, you know, the greatest period of American creativity in literature and in other areas too, arguably, was the, uh, in the 20th century, was the 20s. And that's because an expatriate community conducted a critique of American society from a foreign vantage point, in that case, Paris. And I, I, I think that, that in spite of the Clinton hiatus, that the politics of light have not yet come to settle on the land of Jefferson, and that we should be prepared uh, on a moment's notice, basically, to, yes, to decamp to Prague <laughs> and, uh, and conduct all this from there. Also, you know, Prague was the capital of European civilization before the Thirty Years' War, before the rise of modern science. Uh, it's an Italianate city, untouched by either world war. It's a, it's a, 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 a beautiful place. I don't like the part of what I do that is a cult of personality. I don't like it that a white guy sits at the front of the room and pontificates, and I don't know if you've figured out this shuffle, but I have, and I know that I don't know anything more than you know, really, and that it's just a, a funny circumstance of fate that you sit and listen and I speak, because there are no experts, and there is only, uh, you know, the integrity of doing and having done. And really, if you get the message, you, you will be able to transcend the need for any more of this because it's really a message of self-trust and self-empowerment. And then what I'm also trying to create is a community of shared associations about these weird states 
so that we don't have to all privately think we're losing our marbles. You know, let those who talk to the elves find each other and band together. I am not um, one, I, I am basically a scientist without portfolio because no academic institution would ever trust me with a portfolio. But I, I move in the domain of the gurus, the channelers, the pontificators, and those with secret revealed knowledge from Atlantis and Lemuria. But I have contempt for all of that, whether it's true or not, because they got there the wrong way. You know, you have to come through... Uh, the rules of evidence and reason. Reason is not science. Don't confuse them. I'm very much a critic of science and the scientific method, but I don't think reason can be tossed out with that uh, bathwater. What is being proposed here is that we are on the brink of the discovery of another world, a world as potentially transforming of our world as the discovery of the Western Hemisphere transformed European civilization in the 1500s. But the world that we're about to discover is inside the mind. It's mental real estate. We who have made consciousness our game by building cities, elaborating literatures, tossing up religions, and setting armies marching. We who have made consciousness our game have barely scratched the surface of human consciousness. And it's not like we haven't had a crack at it. I mean, these yogins have been over there digging away for millennia, Egyptian religion, Kabbalism, alchemy, Western traditions of mysticism, and, and I am a connoisseur of all that, don't get me wrong, but what astonishes me is how embryonic it all is. We are not the tired inheritors of an ancient and sophisticated civilization in its twilight, which is what they're all telling us. We are the know-nothing, fresh scrub babes who are the new kids on the block who haven't got a clue as to what the human enterprise could really be about. And we are coming now through a very narrow historical neck where the accumulated stupidity of the last 5,000 years, it, the dues now have to be paid. It ain't fair. We didn't do it. You know, we didn't bring the slaves from Africa. We didn't invent oligarchy. We didn't do all these things. Nobody's interested in our whining about how we didn't do it. It's in your face. And it's clearly a crisis of two things, of consciousness and of conditioning. These are the two things that the psychedelics attack. We have the technological power, the engineering skills to save our planet, to cure disease, to feed the hungry, to end war, but we lack the intellectual vision, the ability to change our minds. We must decondition ourselves from 10,000 years of bad behavior. And it's not easy. I mean, imagine, I don't know how many of you have ever confronted the fact that you were addicted to something. And some addictions are really serious. If you've ever been addicted to tobacco or heroin, I'm sure you know what I mean. Well, then imagine a global population addicted to a drug the use of which is killing us, but we can't, there's no, there's no doctor saying you should, there's no rehab clinic to go to when you're a species. We are on an absolutely destructive bender that will end with the death of the earth, the impoverishment of its animal and plant population, and the collapse of our civilization into scarcity unless unless we can somehow restructure 
our psychology uh, and, and get hold of ourselves. And psychedelics are the only thing I've ever seen work on an individual level to do that. Uh, you know, in the early 60s, they were curing 75% of chronic alcoholism cases that they treated with LSD. They were curing with one dose of LSD, one 500 microgram dose. Well, now, obviously, LSD is not a magic bullet for alcoholism. That's a preposterous idea. It's simply that you take LSD, and if you're a chronic alcoholic, you review your life, and you notice that you're killing yourself. And then you say, my God, I am killing myself. If I don't stop what I'm doing, I will be dead. That's the strongest motivation to character rehabilitation there is. And that's what we have to carry into the domain of public debate. I can't believe how constipated American institutions are. I mean, here we are under the aegis of a great crusading reformer from Arkansas. A new order in human affairs has dawned, but they suggest closing an air base out at Sacramento, and there are editorials as to whether we can survive the shock of this massive change. Well, I've got news for you. Uh, you better do your change-related calisthenics if that was heavy lifting, because what you've got coming at you is, is something very, very different. We are now in a position to actually um, uh, make something of ourselves, extend the design process to human destiny, and, to, and produce something that will redeem 10,000 years of pogroms and migrations and attempted genocides and pointless wars and stupid religions that make people hate themselves and all the rest of it. If we're going to redeem that legacy, then we have to do something quite spectacular. Now, I want to totally contradict myself. Uh, this is not only everybody's uh, prerogative, but it's your obligation. If you don't contradict yourself, your position isn't complex enough. <laughs> I, I, I will talk a little bit about uh, what I've learned from psychedelics. I'm, I feel self-conscious doing it, but on the other hand, wouldn't it be stupid for me to talk about what you've learned from psychedelics? Uh, that would add presumption to the sins already uh, uh, arrayed here. There are different models about what, how, what the psychedelic experience is. Here's a couple. Building on Western psychotherapy, as elaborated by Freud and Jung, one view of what psychedelics are is it's the part of your mind that you'd rather not do business with. It's the memories of childhood neglect or abuse. It's uh, repressed kinky fantasies. It's, in other words, the, uh, the Freudian idea of the unconscious, that somehow these are drugs which dissolve the boundary between conscious and unconscious mind, and then you can do accelerated psychotherapy because resistances have been pharmacologically overcome. That's one model. It's good as far as it goes. It just doesn't go far enough. Then there's another model, which I would call the traditional or shamanic model. And it says, uh, the cosmos is a series of levels. And these levels are connected by... Um, um, vertical routes of access, which can be thought of as simply flights through space, or magical trees, or magical ladders. Anyway, there's an, an image of ascent. And ordinary people exist on only one of these levels. But a shaman is not an ordinary person. A shaman is a superhuman person who has the power of animal allies behind them, and they can go up and down 
in these elevators that move between levels and they can therefore recover lost souls, see uh, social hanky-panky theft and adultery, see the causes behind that, see the causes behind disease, so forth and so on. That would be the traditional one. Uh, the, what I have concluded after 25 years of fiddling with this is that both of those ideas have a certain uh, something to recommend them, but that they don't go far enough and that we get more to the meat of this if we leave off psychological, the first explanation, or sociological, the second explanation, and actually go for something a little more uh, formal, to wit, a mathematical model of what shamanism is. And what I mean by that is, let's think about what shamans do. They cure disease, and another way of putting that is they have a remarkable facility for choosing patients who will recover. They predict weather, they're very important. They tell where uh, game has gone, the movement of game. And they seem to have an, an paranormal ability to look into questions, as I mentioned, who's sleeping with who, who stole the chicken, uh, who, you know, social uh, transgressions are an open book to them. Well, thinking about this from a mathematician's point of view, a, a, an all-encompassing explanation that would explain how all these magical feats are done is simply to suppose that the shaman is somehow able to project his consciousness, his or her consciousness, into a higher dimension. Not metaphorically, as in Sylvester Stallone has many dimensions, not metaphorically, but literally, as in one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, and four. Because if you could move into the fourth dimension, the, men the dimension orthogonal to Newtonian space-time, seeing what the weather is going to be next week is as easy as seeing what the weather is now. Seeing where the game went is as easy as seeing where the game are. Knowing who stole the chicken is simply defined by looking to see who stole the chicken. And I have noticed that all of biology, not simply shamanism within the context of human society, but all of biology is, in a sense, a conquest of dimensionality. That as we ascend the phylogeny of organic life, what animals are, are a strategy for conquering space-time. And complex animals do it better than simpler animals. And we do it better than any complex animal. And we 20th century people do it better than any people in any previous century because we can bind data in so many ways that they couldn't, electronically, on film, on tape, so forth and so on. So the, the progress of organic life is deeper and deeper into dimensional conquest. Well, from that point of view, then, the shaman begin to look like the advance guard of a new kind of human being. A human being that is as advanced over where we are as we are advanced over uh, people a million years ago because we have, uh, you know, very elaborate strategies for coding the past. It's a dimensional conquest. So that's part of what I've learned about psychedelics. And I could have left it there, but I never do. I uh, always want to bring more in under the umbrella of whatever metaphor it is that's being pushed. And what I have discerned 
is uh, that time is actually speeding up. That the universe is not what physics tells us it is. Physics tells us that the universe is an, a physical system, an entropic system that was born in immense energy and chaos and will run down with a bang, I mean with a whimper, not a bang, run down into heat entropy and dissipation. Uh, the psychedelic data on this is completely different. The psychedelic data says what that model left out was biology and mind. Now, biology, you might imagine, is a fairly ephemeral, recent, fragile phenomenon. It is not. The average star in this galaxy gutters out after about 700 million years. Not our star. We happen to have the good fortune to be around a very stable, slow-burning star. But there has been biology on this planet at least two billion years. Three times the average life of a star. So biology is not some Johnny-come-lately epiphenomena. Biology is a phenomenon more persistent than the life of the stars themselves. And uh, biology is not a static thing. I mean, a star evolving now is not greatly different from a star evolving a billion years ago. Biology doesn't work that way. Biology constantly changes the context in which evolution occurs. The way I have downloaded this into a phrase is the universe is, the biological universe at least, is a novelty conserving engine. Upon simple molecules are built complex molecules. Upon complex molecules are built complex polymers. Upon complex polymers comes DNA. Out of DNA comes the whole machinery of the cell. Out of cells comes simple uh, aggregate colony animals like hydra and that sort of thing. Out of that, true animals. Out of that, ever more complex animals, organs of locomotion, organs of sight, organs of smell, complex mental machinery for the coordinating of data in time and space. This is the whole story of the advancement of life. And in our species, it reaches its culmination and it crosses over into a new domain where change no longer occurs in the, in the atomic and biological machinery of existence. It begins to take place in this world which we call mental. It's called epigenetic change. Change which cannot be traced back to mutation of the arrangements of molecules inside long chain polymers, but change taking place in syntactical structures that are linguistically based. And people have probably been using language with considerable facility for probably 50,000 years, possibly more. Uh, in our own time, we have created ever more elaborate languages, ever more elaborate technologies for transforming, storing, and retrieving language, so that we are actually on the brink, I mean, of being able to give every single one of you the complete cultural inventory, the complete database of human beings' experience on this planet. That's what these data highways and networks are all about. The nervous system is being hardwired. But what I wanted to draw your attention to about this is it is not only an advance deeper and deeper into novelty, but it's an advance which, in which each successive stage occurs more quickly than the stage which preceded it. So, you know, once you get the Big Bang, then nothing much happens for a long, long time. I mean, there's plasma streaming through the universe. The universe is slowly cooling. 
But that's the most dramatic complex process in the universe, this cooling. Then after a certain point, more complex processes come in. Complexification begins to build. And as it builds, it begins to happen faster and faster and faster. And the great puzzle in the biological record is the suddenness of our own emergence, of our emergence, human emergence, out of, primate, out of the primate line. It happened with enormous suddenness. Uh, Lumholtz calls it the most explosive reorganization of a major organ of a higher animal in the entire fossil record. And that's, you know, a great embarrassment to the theory of evolution because this is the organ which generated the theory of evolution. We're talking an appendix or an eyebrow here. We're talking the very organ which generated it. I think that we are not, that we have taken far too much responsibility for what is happening. And that what we took to be a staircase we were climbing is actually an up escalator. And if you will stop climbing, you will notice that it does not impede your upward progress because the ground you're standing on is moving you toward the goal. And I, I think that... Uh, this idea, which may be the proof that I'm bonkers, requires a fairly radical reorganization of consciousness. Because what I'm saying is the universe was not born in a fiery explosion from which it has been being blasted outward ever since. The universe is not being pushed like that from behind. The universe is being pulled from the future toward a goal that is as inevitable as a, bowl, as a marble reaching the bottom of a bowl when you release it up near the rim. You know, if you do that, the marble will roll down the side of the bowl, down, 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 and eventually it will come to rest in the lowest energy state, which is the bottom of the bowl. That's precisely my model of human history. And the, now, bear in mind what the competition is peddling. The competition is peddling the idea that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. Now, whatever you think about that, notice that it's the limit case for credulity. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if you, believe, if you can believe that, I, it's hard for me to imagine what you would balk at. If we were to sit down and say, let's see who can think of the most unlikely thing that could possibly happen, I submit to you, nobody could top the Big Bang. It is the improbability of improbabilities. It is the improbability, it is the mother of all improbabilities right there. So I'm suggesting something different. I'm suggesting that the universe is pulled toward a complex attractor that exists ahead of us in time and that our ever accelerating speed through the phenomenal world of connectivity and novelty is based on the fact that we are now very, very close to the attractor. All Western religions have insisted that God would come tangential to history, but they all lose their nerve when you ask when, which is the only interesting question about that hypothesis. I mean, if it's not now, then what the hell difference does it make? It's just pissing in the wind, as far as I can see. Uh, I think that the very real social crisis that is upon us, the crisis of population, of resource depletion, of atmospheric degradation, of epidemic disease, all these crises indicate that we are now down to the short epochs of this process of universal ingression into novelty. And that, in fact, it makes no sense whatsoever to speak of a human future. 
There is no human future. It's inconceivable, given where we are today, that to speak of the human world a thousand years from now or 500 years from now. It is literally, it either doesn't exist or it's beyond our power of imagining. It isn't simply going to be non-polluting cars and smaller hi-fi speakers. I mean, that's an idiot's notion. Yeah, clearer TV pictures. Uh, and st it isn't like that at all. I mentioned this this morning, how when you look at only one line of technological development, automobiles or computers, it looks like you can rationally anticipate what's going to happen. But when you realize that there are thousands of these lines of development all transforming themselves, all moving towards some kind of omega point, then you realize that we're in the grip of what I call a concrescence. And I maintain that you don't have to believe me on this. You can see it from here. You just have to climb a high hill. There's one. It's called psilocybin. There's one. It's called ayahuasca. The view from the tops of these hills is of the concrescence. It lies now closer to us than the Johnson administration, for God's sake, in time. And, uh, uh, you know, I have an elaborate mathematical theory to back this up, which you should gratefully learn you are not going to be flayed with this afternoon, but I think it's going to be very, become more and more important for people to delinearize their view of time decondition yourself from the lie of history. Uh, after all, you know, uh, if, if time were space, history would be a spider web. <laughs> so <laughs> bear that in mind. <laughs> ah, concrescence. Concrescence is a word that I cribbed from the metaphysics of Alfred North Whitehead. And in fact, much of what I say, Whitehead provides the foundation for. He, like myself, had the idea that, that history grows toward what he called a nexus of completion. Oh, and, the, and these nexi of completion themselves grow together into what he called the concrescence. So a concrescence is a domain of extremely high novelty in comparison to whatever it's embedded in. So for instance, uh, you walking in the wilderness, you are a concrescence because you are more complex than the medium you're moving through. A raisin embedded in a cornmeal muffin is a concrescence. It is more complex than the muffin matrix in which it finds itself. So a concrescence is a local state of unusually high complexity. And uh, a concrescence exerts a kind of attraction. Uh, let's call it uh, the, the temporal equivalent of gravity so that all objects in the universe are drawn through time, not space. Gravity draws you through time. Space, uh, gravity th draws you through space. Time draws you toward the concrescence. This is why the universe is seen to be becoming more and more complex, faster and faster. Yeah. Well, first of all, no, no, we, we, had a, we had a meeting of the Rebbe's on this one, and we got it figured out. Uh, we're, we're using uh, 1118 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, December 21st, 2012 A.D., and this is all based on a bunch of fishy mathematics that need not concern you here, but which you would pay dearly to hear in some other context. <laughs> uh, the idea being, you see, that each epoch being shorter than the one that preceded it 
this generates an asymptotic curve of approach. And the, it's become a cliche of our culture that time is speeding up. It actually is speeding up. It's not that it seems like it's speeding up. It looks like it's speeding up. It is speeding up. We and our entire world are being drawn into confrontation with something that at this level is lost below the event horizon of rational apprehension. That's a fancy way of saying you don't, can't know jack shit about it at this point in time. At, there will come a moment when it will rise above the horizon of rational apprehension. But, uh, and I see, I really, I think that history is a set of nested resonances. This is what I mean when I say nothing is unannounced. Nothing can take you by surprise if you've really been paying attention because everything is preceded by its harbingers and heralds. And uh, we are living in an era now where there is a great deal of apocalyptic expectation, anticipation, and hysteria for several reasons. First of all, because Christianity just is hysterical in all times and places. Second of all, there's a built-in goose in the calendar because we're approaching a millennial year, and that always exacerbates this Christian thing outrageously uh, because of the promise made, you know, amen, amen, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away before I return to, you know, clean your plow or whatever it is. Uh, so, uh, and there is the physical evidence all around us that we are the witnesses to a planetary crisis that we cannot control or manage. I mean, uh, there are, it's very hard to believe that we could manage ourselves back into a steady state. I mean, yeah, the Jews are talking to the Arabs and they're trying to get things straightened out in South Africa, but what about the global population curve? What about the degrading atmosphere? I mean, you know, you don't necessarily, you're just as dead even if you're not killed by a racist or a fascist. So we can get certain problems under control, but it seems certain problems are beyond our control. Also, there's another level to all this, which is when you take cores from the Greenland ice, or make side-ranging radar maps of the Canadian shield, you discover that it, it, we are not the only force for disruption and chaos wandering around the universe looking for trouble. The universe is an incredibly chaotic and unstable place. Planetesimal impacts on the Earth have, have uh, reset the biological clock at least three times in the last billion years. Uh, what we have been living through for the past 50,000 years is an unusual era of metastability, and it has allowed us to create a global civilization. But we can't assume that we have 50,000 years of stability ahead of us, or even 100,000 years of stability ahead of us. And finally, you know, this curious resistance to the idea of the end of the world always amuses me because maybe the world will end and maybe it won't end. But have you ever noticed that the end of your world is a, an absolute certainty? You're going to go into the yawning grave and rather soon, I should suspect, uh, and possibly sooner than you're prepared for. So uh, quibbling over the end of other people's world seems like a philosophical argument compared to the certainty of your own uh, finality. Yeah. Um, well, I've just been kind of recently playing around with a, a Stephen Hawking's book, and I wondered if you could comment or critique it and say how that creates parallel universes or not to your view of them. Well, that's an interesting question, uh, and I've been thinking about it. The question is, out of Stephen Hawking's book about parallel worlds and, and black holes and stuff, how can these physical oddities or, or anomalies be related to what I'm talking about? Well, 
First of all, we don't know what a black hole is. Uh, a black hole has at the center of it a singularity. The definition of singularity is you don't know what it is. Uh, she way of making theories, by the way. Uh, Stephen Hawking is a prime example. At one point in his career, he was very keen for what were called mini black holes. And these were black holes that were uh, under a centimeter in size. And a certain reading of his theory required 10 high 16 of these things in the universe. Well, when you realize that there's a singularity at the center of each one of them, you say, well, hell, what kind of physics are you doing? If you have a physical theory that has 10 high 16 exceptions to whatever rules it lays down, this isn't a theory. This is a sieve that you're waving around in the air. Uh, however, the black hole does bear on this because uh, imagine an observer standing outside the event horizon of a black hole watching an object approach the black hole. What you see, and this is similar to the argument or the example I gave a few minutes ago of the marble on the edge of the bowl. What you see is this, let's make it a spacecraft. This spacecraft that approaches the event horizon of the black hole, and then it's caught in the, in the gravitational tidal forces of the black hole, and it begins to go faster and faster, around and around, faster and faster, and at a certain point, it disappears into the singularity. This is from the point of view of an observer outside the system. Now we flash to the stalwart captain and crew on the bridge of this starship. What happens to, from their point of view, what happens is as they sink below the event horizon of the black hole and start the descent toward the singularity, time and space are dilated so dramatically that the singularity recedes to an infinite distance and you fall forever toward it. Well, what I would like to suggest, based on, uh, well, Here's what I'd like to suggest. This is one way of thinking about it, that our planet is on a collision course with something which we actually, at our present state of knowledge, don't have a word for. A black hole is simply a gravitationally massive object, so massive that no light can leave it. What I'm talking about is something like that, except that uh, it isn't so much gravitationally massive as temporally massive. We are being sucked into the body of eternity. And I think it's going to happen very soon. Now, an obvious objection that someone would make to this, it's a, it's a probabilistic objection, is they would say, don't you find it rather unusual that your own very minute and finite life should occur so close to this moment of universal dramatic climax? Doesn't that clue you to the fact that you might be slightly deluded? <laughs> to which I reply, not at all. <laughs> because <clears throat> I think of this event horizon as a series of like ghost horizons. And once you enter into history, what history is, is the outer shell of the gravitational field of the attractor of the concrescence. In other words, uh, history is the disturbance in nature which precedes the concrescence. It precedes it by only 50,000 years. Uh, uh, a microsecond, so a geological microsecond before all life is melted down in the presence of the singularity, there is a curious interface zone that is not the singularity and not the absence of the singularity. It's the singularity in the act of becoming. 
and it only lasts as a geological microsecond. When you, the first subject first came up about this day, you said that you described it as something we could know absolutely nothing about. So how do you substantiate the criteria in which you uh, pointed towards this day? Well, no, no. Uh, we can, you can predict where an electron will be without knowing what an electron is. In fact, no one knows what an electron is. And we predict their occurrence very easily. What can't be known about the singularity or the concrescence, uh, it simply lies be beyond rational apprehension. But the map of the phase space in which this concrescence is happening looks very much like an involuting spiral of some sort. Uh, in principle, the thing is unknowable in time, because if you could know it, you would not be in time. Actually, it maps rather well onto Thomas Aquinas's notion of the nature of God, but I don't think we should make too much of that. Yeah. So the question was, is to describe the multi-dimensional multi bands that are being lifted, specifically in the last few minutes. Yes, well, here, here is my notion. The, it's, it's fairly, fairly simple, I think. It's, it's a series of nested cycles where each cycle is only 1 64th in duration of the cycle which precedes it. So let's start with a cycle big enough that we can drop the whole life of our cosmos into it with plenty of elbow room. Okay? So astrophysics tells us that the universe is between, uh, at one end of the spectrum, 15 billion years, at the other end of the spectrum, 25 billion years. So let's give it plenty of elbow room. Let's use a figure like 70 billion years. That's our great cycle. Now, inside that cycle, there is a compressed cycle at the terminal end, the end which we call the future end. It has a past to future. At the, at the future end, there is a terminal cycle which is 1 64th of 70 billion years. Uh, that's roughly 1 billion years. And nested at the end of that billion year cycle at the future end is uh, a, six, a 640 million year cycle. No. Whatever a billion divided by 64 is, anyway. And then at the end of that cycle, another cycle, 1 64th as large. Well, eventually, if you keep collapsing these, you'll get down to a cycle that is 4,300 years long and change. Uh, that is the domain of true human history. I mean, granted, there were things went on before 4,300 years ago, but bloody little. I mean, 4,300 years in the past takes us back to uh, before the building of the Great Pyramids, basically. So you can see, okay, well then in that 4,306 year cycle, at the end of it comes a 67 year cycle that has all the themes of all these larger cycles compressed and folded into it. Only 67 years. It began on August the 5th, 1945, with a faint echo of the Big Bang as the atomic flower blossomed over Hiroshima. It runs from that day, August the 5th, 1945, to December 2012, December 21, 2012, but 384 days before you reach that date, you cross into an, a, a cycle only 384 days long that has all these larger cycles compressed in it. And six days before you reach the zero point, you cross through 
into a domain of only six days duration that has all these huge cycles compressed in it from six days to an hour and 35 minutes and six seconds to 1.3 seconds to 0.035 seconds down to the domain of Planck's constant. Six 0.55 times 10 to the minus 23rd erg seconds. Technically, we refer to it as a jiffy. <laughs> you finally, you get down to one jiffy. Uh, well, now, what is happening? Imagine the complex. Oh, well, here's the point I want to make. If you have a universe like that, 72 billion years in duration, it will undergo half of its evolution in the last 30 seconds of its existence. Can you imagine? Now, this is what the scientists do, except they spin it around. And that's why, uh, I can't remember who wrote it, but the book called The First Three Minutes, Steven Weinberg's book, The First Three Minutes, a book about the first three minutes in the life of the universe where he leads you through all this complex physics as matter is crystallizing out of hyperspace and all this stuff. All I'm saying is, let's put the complexity in the more likely end of the cycle. Let's put it at the end when after billions of years of evolution and all kinds of complexity and that sort of thing, uh, everything comes together. So this kind of a cycle, if we were actually living in a universe like this, could completely unfold itself according to its natural laws and yet provide a miracle, the miracle of the concrescence. That's why I'm so keen on boundary dissolution. The more boundaries that have dissolved, the closer to concrescence we are. And when you finally reach it, there are no boundaries. You are eternity. You are all space and time. You are alive and dead, here and there, before and after. The singularity is a coincidentia positorum. It can simultaneously coexist in states which are contradictory. It is, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas' vision of God. It's, uh, it, it's uh, something which transcends rational apprehension. But it gives the universe meaning because all process then can be seen to be a seeking and a moving and an effort to approximate, connect with, and attend to this transcendental object at the end of time. One way of thinking of it is like those bar balls that they hang in discos that send out thousands of reflections off everybody and everything in the room. Well, think of the transcendental object at the end of time as that bar ball, and then those reflected, twinkling, refractive lights are religions, scientific theories, gurus, works of art, poetry, great orgasms, great souffles, great paintings. In other words, anything which has, we even use this phrase, anything which has a spark of divinity in it is in fact a referent to the original source of the sparks of all divinity, which is the concrest, compressed, experience of life and mind after billions of billions of years of unfolding itself within the confines of three-dimensional space. And you can make this vision your friend through psychedelics because, as I said at the beginning of this rave, you can see it from here. Of course, not if you have your face plunged in your stock portfolio. You're not going to see it, no. But if you will go up on the mountain and take five dried grams in silent darkness and pray through the night, you will absolutely guaranteed uh, uh, come into a sense of this thing. And it is, it's, it's real. And history is simply a... a, a um, perturbation on the surface of the waters of time as we approach the lip of this cascade into concrescence 
novelty and completion. And the psychedelics raise you out of the historical matrix and give you a sense of participation in this transcendental reality. It's the essence of religion. It's the essence of psychic balance. It's the source of shamanic power and mental health. Thank you. In Iranian households, as a fumigant and incense, you just throw some on a charcoal, on a bed of coals, and it makes this wonderful um, incense like smoke, which is actually intoxicating. Uh, I mean, a, a wonderful thing to do if you want to do some exploratory chemistry is take. Uh, Take half a dose, take half a dose of mushrooms, and then after a couple of hours, smoke some pergamon harmala in a, in a bong or a pipe. And the MAO inhibiting characteristic of the harmaline will immediately lift the curtain for about 15 minutes on a very spectacular series of very cool hallucinations. In other words, they're hallucinations where you can just sit and look thinking, my goodness, this is fascinating and compelling, <laughs> rather than the other kind of hallucination where you're, <gasps> <laughs> you know. So we call this uh, mushroom plus pagam and harmala combination vegetable television <laughs> because it, it's approximately that engaging but very, very uh, non-threatening and, and reassuring for beginners. That's a mix of mushrooms. After an hour and a half, smoke uh, a quarter of a teaspoon of pagamon harmala seeds. Oh, yeah, they're very small and hard and black, and you'll want to get a a brawn coffee grinder. A brawn coffee grinder is a great tool for the would-be psychoactivist. <laughs> it will uh, it will grind it will flour nutmeg, reduce nutmeg to flour. That's nutmeg's fascinating. I used to take it when I was in high school. I used to take it uh, at night, and I would stay up late and study. It would sort of wire me. And then I would sleep, but when I would wake up in the morning, I would be absolutely smashed. And I didn't even know what it really was. It was, all, it was almost before I smoked cannabis. So I was dealing with this, these walks to school in the morning where all the colors were bright, a song on my lips, a skip in my step. I could hardly... Um, and uh, you can also reduce uh, morning glory seeds to flour in one of those brawn grinders. So that's a very good kit. Yeah. No, I uh, I ground it in a mortar and pestle fairly crudely. At that phase, ether tend to be slightly tricky for the non-chemist to work with. Uh, so, but if you are a chemist, go, go to the literature and, and you'll figure it out. A solvent which, which sometimes works, which is non-explosive relatively, is a grain alcohol. But grain alcohol, the reason chemists don't use it is because it's not, it's not very efficient. It, you'll get like 60 to 70 percent of a sample where if you go to chloroform or pet ether, you can push that up to 96, 97 uh, percent. If you get the seed, again, treat it like the morning glory. Flour it in a, in a very fine grinder. Those seeds are hard as hell, so you've got to do that. Flour it, soak it in water, shake the water vigorously several times. A, a fairly lar the larger the volume of water, the more efficient the filtration, or the extraction will be, and then pour all the water through a melitta filter and then collect the, the, the uh, 
uh, you know, the water and to, and to take it. I don't think it would be a good idea to try to concentrate that by, by heat or you'll destroy the active principle. These beta carbolines, harmine, harmaline, they all have a, there is a slight stomach thing. Uh, they come on in about an hour. There's what's called visual streaming. I am assuming, first of all, I'm making a number of assumptions here, that you are sitting in silent darkness and that you are, have an empty stomach. And then you get visual streaming, which if you've never seen this, it's basically... It looks like you're driving through a bunch of after images. You're dri there are these purple and chartreuse lights sliding past. And when you stare forward, you can see them sliding past. After about 10 minutes of that, and possibly a hit of cannabis, it becomes more explicit. And you move into the realm of, of what's called hypnagogia. Hypnagogia are dancing mice little colored candies, pieces of ribbons, gears, screws, the, the, the trivia, the, the uh, impedimentia of the phantasmagoria of your mind, you know. And then after about 10 minutes of that, and of course what's happening if you have a pharmacological vision of this is thousands of these molecules are arriving at the synaptic site of activity elbowing aside the local population of uh, endogenous neurotransmitters getting them out of the way plugging themselves in taste but what you do is you just cap it up flower it and cap it up you know it contains meristocin which is psychoactive and which is a precursor for MDMA and is a, quite a nice thing. I mean, it's not going to shake the foundations of the planet, but it's very good. What? A couple. Not a lot. Oh, that's what I should say. <laughs> Do not, uh, you know, people sometimes with plants, they get the attitude that you need to do a lot because it's spread thin. In most cases, that's true, but in the case of nutmeg, it isn't true. It's a cap, a double O capsule. It just doesn't count for the spice that you can buy from the chili spice rack of nutmeg? No, it does. Same, same. Yeah, well, the reason I preferred grinding the whole nutmeg was because it's obviously fresher if it's ground. And you can buy whole nutmeg at Safeway. Prisoners know this. If you'd done more hard time, you wouldn't be asking these questions. <laughs> well, let me say a little bit more about this. Uh, the Zoroastrian religion is generally considered to precede the Vedic religion of Soma. Soma is this mysterious Vedic intoxicant of great antiquity. The ninth mandala of the Rig Veda is this enormous hymn of praise to Soma, greater than Indra, it says. Uh, unbroken throughout the history of the Zoroastrian religion is the sacrament of Hauma, H-A-O-M-A. Hauma and Soma appear to be historically related, and Hauma is Pagaman Harmala. If you're interested in reading about all this, there's a book uh, called Hauma and Harmaline by uh, David Flattery. It's uh, Near East Publication number 23, and it's available from the Near East Studies Department of UC Berkeley fascinating book. I mean, you learn, for instance, that in the classic phase of the Zoroastrian religion, the only method for gaining knowledge about the invisible world was the use of drugs. Any other method was scorned as completely preposterous. And since this is rather close to my own position, uh, I'm pleased to find it in place. Uh, they talk in that book, they discuss how there is this concept in Zoroastrianism of what is called the Menang, the Menang world. And the Menang world is only accessible through Haoma. It's only accessible through pharmacological means. That's 
Yes, our gyria nervosa, if you're an enthusiast of obscure hallucinogens, this is one to reckon with. Possibly, gram for gram, it is the most powerful plant hallucinogen on the planet. And yet, though there are 13 species of our gyria, all containing psychoactive compounds, spread from Kerala in India down through Micronesia, there's no history of human usage in that entire cultural area. So there are mysteries about who knows these things. You know, when you go to the Amazon, most people have a kind of noble savage prejudice, and they think that it has to be the naked people who are off river who are very wild and woolly, and then they make the good ayahuasca. Often this is not the case. Often it's the guy who lives on the edge of Iquitos or Pucallpa who tends his garden and uh, is fairly conversant with the modern world. Some of you may know Manuel Cord um, F. Bruce Lamb's book, um, Rio Tigre and Beyond. He describes a situation in there where... Uh, uh, a man who had in his youth been kidnapped by Indians and learned to make very good ayahuasca. Later, he encounters another tribe of Indians. He's on a rosewood collecting expedition to a remote part of the jungle. And he encounters these Indians and they invite him to take ayahuasca with them. And it's just garbage as far as this guy can tell. So he says, I'll show you how they do it where I come from and makes it for these people and literally becomes a culture hero overnight, <laughs> is hailed as the, the great reformer of their ritual and just simply because he showed them how to get really, really smashed uh, on it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the DMT is in the desmanthus, and the and the pergamon contains the MAO inhibiting harmaline. It's in the seed of the, the desmanthus. No, it's in the root bark scrapings, and the harmala, the harmine, the harmaline in pergamon harmala is spread throughout the plant and concentrated in the little black seeds. If you don't want to drive out to Elko find an Iranian market here in L.A. and tell them that you want to buy Hermal, H-U-R-M-A-L, and they will sell you the seeds of Pagaman Harmala. It's used, uh, it's the dogma. Yeah. Can you explain a little more about Morning Glory Seeds? Morning Glory Seeds, yes. Now, this is something that's accessible and that those of you who find yourselves bemoaning the lack of, of availability could overcome. The, the heavenly blue morning glory with the heart-shaped leaf, that's important because I see around here, I see blue morning glories with a leaf that looks like a grape leaf. That's not it, folks. That won't do it. It has to have a, a valentine-shaped leaf and this brilliant blue or white or white and blue flower. Those are hybrids. The blue is the wild type. It's called heavenly blue. The white is called pearly gates and the white and blue is called flying saucer. These guys must have been doing more than... Uh, <clears throat> Something was up. Now... Listen carefully, and I'll avoid a lawsuit, and you'll avoid a tummy ache. The morning glory seeds, which are sold in garden stores here, are the morning glory that you want, the blue, heavenly blue morning glory. But seed companies have dipped these seeds in a poison specifically to keep you from getting high off these morning glory seeds. So what you have to do then is uh, overcome this by stealth. Always our best weapon. <laughs> stealth means buy the morning glories and grow them and produce an uncontaminated crop of your own. Now the morning glory seeds that you will produce by this means you have to take 
around 250 for a person of ordinary body weight. So if you are low or high, make the adjustment accordingly. Uh, the morning glory seeds can be floured in your brawn grinder and then mixed into applesauce or a milkshake or some thick medium because actually it's pretty disgusting. Mm -hmm. Now there's a slight problem here, which is the seed also contains ester coumarone, which is an emetic and makes your, your stomach cramp. So you, that will leave after about an hour. So you can either pay your dues and sit there with a terrible tummy ache for this very critical hour, or there are strategies for getting that ester coumarone out of there with solvent washes. I don't want to give the details because too many people blow themselves to kingdom come. High molecular weight solvents like chloroform and petroleum.